powerful will create a protest and there will not be a power in the world that can stop us. We gotta be proud to be black. Don't worry about what they say. We gotta think smarter and live smarter. We gotta want more and work harder. Cause they ain't giving it to us. Put you all in. If you truly wanna make it, can't be waiting for handouts, baby. You gotta take it. Like Martin gotta have a dream. Cause he had one. Like Malcolm by any means, gotta get that done. Don't be ashamed of who you are. Stick your chest out proud. Make them believe that you're the best. Show them what you about. We gotta love each other. Stop killing each other. We gotta unitize and don't believe the lies. This is a message to the blacks and any other. The minority live well and love self. That's the priority. TP been taught for so many centuries that they are nobody is not easy. So they very skillfully uh, made you and me hate our African identity. Maybe the English language should be reconstructed so that teachers will not be forced to teach the Negro child 60 ways to despise himself and thereby perpetuate his false sense of inferiority. Okay our features and our skin and our blood why we had to end up hating ourselves it made us feel inferior we must no longer be ashamed of being black everybody habaragani which means in swahili what's the news and you would respond with the principle of today of the nguza saba which is the seven principles of kwanzaa Today's principle is umoja, which means unity. Umoja means to strive for and maintain unity in the family, the community, race, and nation. And Lord, do we need unity among black Americans. You, there's so many different levels of black Americans. Some of them just be amazing me, and especially the ones that are sounding like the oppressors. And I think y'all know who I'm talking about. But anyway, there are six more principles of Kwanzaa. Find a Kwanzaa event going on in your city and join them in the celebration and find out what the other six principles are. I'm not going to tell you. I just started off today, Habaragani, which means what's the news. Today is Umoja, unity. And I hope our people come together and unify today. All right, now with that said, welcome to Satora's Black History Corner Internet Program at allpointstv.com. I am your host, Catherine Hunter-Williams. My co-host, uh, Miss Catherine Blake, would not be here today. She's spending Christmas time in this, this time with her family uh, down in Pontiac in Detroit and Kalamazoo. She's all over the place, and I pray she's enjoying herself. She needed a break. Hallelujah. Okay, today we're going to start off with a myth that's being told about white Irish slavery and the people who are perpetrating this lie. We're going to squash this lie today because it's going around and what's going, happening is, is, is getting uh, young people involved in this and hate groups are popping up all over the country. So let's get it on. All right. For nearly a century, following the end of Reconstruction, many Americans grew comfortable with a certain fantasy version of the antebellum South, blessed with blushing bellies, kindly planners, and happy slaves. Not true. In the popular minstrel shows of the late 1800s, white performers in blackface wobble songs like My Old Kentucky Home and Carry Me Back to Old Virginia, Virginia, Virginia. This disturbingly not this disturbing old view of slavery, I couldn't pronounce that word, John. Of old views of slavery gained even more ground with the blockbuster success of Margaret Mitchell's novel Gone with the Wind and the Oscar winning 1939 film based on the book. In the 1960s, the civil rights movement brought this so called Magnolia myth crashing to the ground, destroying the illusion that enslaved people were willing participants in a system that robbed them of their freedom and humanity. 
Yet even today, more than 150 years after the Civil War has ended, a few enduring myths sometimes emerge to the muddle, to muddle the conversation about slavery and its role in our nation's history. John, could you put that picture up about um, Peter? Not Peter, I'm sorry. The one where the, the slave is being the man that's being captured. The African slave. So I, cause I want them to see how this, this, how they got this uh, net over this, this African man. And this was one of the ways they captured uh, Africans and brought them to the boat and brought them here to this country to serve as slaves. Now let's get to this hate group do this, this, this stuff that's going on, uh, about hate that's going on in this country. Hate groups have long inspired racist violence and hatred in this country, and they're getting stronger daily. Today, hate mongers use far more sophisticated language to influence others with their racist ideology, and they're recruiting young people on the college campuses instead of in the woods with burning crosses like they used to do back in the old days. They would go out in the woods and light up a cross and have their meetings, and then they had their members invite other members, which that's how they would get younger people and some older people too. Now, today, they're attempting to mainstream their racism and influence politicians and the government with a far-reaching agenda that seeks to undo decades of progress advances that have made our nations more fair and just. One of the most common ways extremists mainstream hate is by masquerading as public policy. Think tanks. Y'all heard of things, think tanks where uh, people come together and they, they think, I guess, and then they come up with these different policies and they submit it to someone. Ah, oh, Lord. Okay, I just said it. That publish studies to influence public opinion and the government in support of racist policies. I kind of just said that a little bit, just a little different. The most alarming avowed racists manage to lodge themselves into our public institutions where they can have direct impact on our lives. Hate mongers have gravitated online. And this is why I'm reading this article. This article came from Investigative Reporting, reporting the Intelligence Report, a uh, uh, magazine that's published by the Southern Poverty Law Center. Hate and extremism in 2016 because today like I said they're going online and who online our children our young adults that's where they are they are basically online but like I said we're gonna break these myths down because right now let me get to where I got to get to my point about white Irish slavery uh, let's see and it is the most alarming of our races managed to lodge themselves into our public institutions where they can have direct impact on our lives. I'm repeating myself. I want to say it one more time. The most alarming of our races manages to lodge themselves into our public institution where they can have direct impact on our lives. Hate mongers have gravi gravitated online because they face less danger. <laughs> you know, they used to wear the the masks, the, uh, the Ku Klux Klan, they would wear uh, white pointed masks and uh, white sheets to cover up their identity. Well, now they're doing it online. And that's because they face less danger of public exposure and embarrassment. Because you don't never know who is a Klansman, who is a part of Stormfront, who is a part of any of these hate groups. I mean, it could be your doctor, your lawyer, your Indian. Da -da 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 -da. It could be anybody. A school teacher could be a hate monger and be a part of these, these groups. They can easily reach younger audiences with hate music and other negative propaganda. And they can join the conversations. You know, they do have conversations. They have a, a what is that, John, on television, I mean, on the internet where you can, or forums. It's forums. They have forums. And they, they can join in those conversations with little effort or 
expense. The largest white Supreme Forum, Supremist Forum, is Stormfront, which I just mentioned a little earlier. It now has more than 300,000 registered members, more than double the number when President Barack Obama was elected. Now the site is adding about 25,000 registered users annually, enough to populate, listen to this, enough to populate a small city. In addition, hate groups are employing the technology provided by major corporations such as Amazon, PayPal, and Apple to make money, move money, and spread their ide ideology. It should never be underestimated just how skilled hate groups and haters are at using the internet, social media, whether for raising money or indoctrination. All right. The Irish slaves meme, which means spreading from person to person or caught on quickly. It may be meme or meme. I just say meme. And it is used to attack the legitis, legitis, legitimacy, did I pronounce that right, John, of the Black Lives Matter movement. The legitimacy of that movement? Yeah. Okay, but um, my we will probably differ. But don't if you're talking about terrorist groups, potentially terrorist groups, they engage in a lot of the same behaviors, you know, as, as those other, uh, you know, the white supremacist organizations. So, um, you know, I I I don't see that. Just, but I mean, it's like you know, that's my opinion of it. So, I don't see how there's much difference between the two. Well, but I'm not talking about them. That's that's the reason. That's why, uh, you know, if we want to get off with the terrorists. That's a whole nother. Show, but I write today. I'm on hate mongers here in this country, which they could also be a part of the terrorist group too. You know, they could be uh, also having them, letting them come in and helping them, cause fire against America. I mean, you know, there's so many different things that's going on out here. But my thing here today is about this white about about Irish slaves, white Irish slaves. Okay, and like I said, what they doing is trying to uh, attack what's going on with the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, racists argue and try to convince others that black Americans shouldn't complain about discrimination because the Irish were also slaves and nobody hears them complaining or they had another word for it but I just said I better not say that word. Is this a mixture of bad history, lies, false equivalents, conspiracy theories, and reductionist fallacies as absurd absurd <coughs> as it sounds I, ideas like this go viral on the internet excuse me and white supremacists are adept users of the internet social media National events are often catalysts for violent actions and new mutations of the radical right. The presidential election obviously speaks for itself and as already discussed, debated, debates on contentious issues like immigration, energizes groups like the border keepers of Alabama. And if y'all know about them, you know what they do to those people uh, that's coming in on the border. They misusing them and all kind of things that are happening to them. Just start watching the border keepers. Uh, predictably, predictably, there has been a strong racist response to the growth of the Black Lives Matters movement, White Lives Matters, and Blue Lives Matters, which is the police, etc. White Lives Matter has very close ties to white supremacist groups and is dedicated to white nationalism and seeks to undermine the issues that Black Lives Matter seeks to raise. In the past year, numerous chapters have popped up across the nations. And I, I just say, wake up people, don't fool yourself. These are hate groups and they are getting stronger on a daily basis. Now let's break down these myths. And these are, this is information that I got off of um, the internet doing some research about it. And one of them is uh, Snopes.com, rumor has it, slaves to the fact. 
And John, can you put up the picture of Peter? Peter uh, is was a slave. And the difference of how these slaves were treated, I'm finna break it down to you. This one is five myths about slavery. Number one, there were Irish slaves in American colonies. As historians and public librarian, Liam Hogan has written, there is unanimous agreement based on overwhelming evidence that Irish that the Irish were never subject, never subject to perpetual hereditary slavery in the colonies based on the notions of race. The enduring myth of Irish slavery, which most often surfaced today in service of Irish nationalists and white supremacist costs, has root in the 17th and 18th century when Irish laborers were derogatory called white slaves. The phase the phrase would later be employed as propaganda by the slave owning South about the industrialized North, along with false claims that life was far harder for immigrant factory workers than for slaves. You heard that one, John? Let's see, uh, Travis, in uh, before the advent of the unions, um, the the union people, you know, not the union, the factory workers. They they lost life and limb. I mean, it was like it was pretty horrific. So I mean, it was now the difference was with you know they they voluntarily went and got employment, but once they got there, they were not treated all too well. But I mean, in the you know in the in the factories, we're talking, you know, in the factories here in Flint. I mean, right there at the Chevrolet, the hole and stuff like that, where the strike occurred. You know, in thirty seven, uh, I had friends who had relatives working there that would get pieces of their bodies cut off. They'd get stitched back up in the infirmary and sent right back, but there was a difference that they were they could they could leave that job if they choose to so it wasn't a a forcement like it a slavery wasn't forced on. but but white slavery i mean of the amongst the um the irish and the scottish to some degree was it was almost very parallel to what went on with the african slaves they were taken off their properties by force by the government troops they were put in ships were, but they were indentured no there's a diff there was slaves too out and out slavery there were not all slaves who were not all whites were indentured servants they were also slaves they were sent all to the caribbean a lot of them were sent from scotland and ireland to the caribbean islands and they suffered the same fate that many of the african slaves did they succumbed to illnesses and uh, being over overworked and to die exhaustion and stuff like that I mean it did happen and so I mean also they had the Eastern the Eastern Europeans um, the word slave comes from the word the the Vikings would call people Slavs and that's the people they enslave well, you know they put as slaves the word slave is like a, a broadening or a corruption of that and they, they were taken they there was people from the Eastern Europe taken into slavery into the Middle East well, let's see what the truth is. Can you put up a couple? It's a two pictures that I have yeah. that shows, especially the one that with the three children on it, because I want to read what it says uh, about that. Uh, because I don't think you can see the read writing on it. Okay, it says uh, white slavery history denied, covered up, or and marginalized. The picture shows, says, the first slaves imported to the American colonies were 100 white children in 1619, four months before the arrival of the first shipment of Africans. Many were brought from Ireland where the law held that it was no more sin to kill an Irishman than a dog or any other brute. The bottom part of the picture, the white part of the picture says, in the 17th century from 1600 to 1699, there were many more Irish sold as slaves than Africans. Okay? That's what that picture says. Now, is this true? If we're talking about slavery as it was practiced on the Africans in the United States, that is hereditary chattel slavery, then the answer is a clear no. As historian and public librarian Liam Hogan writes in the paper, in, in the, a paper titled, The Myth of Irish Slaves in the Colonies, 
Persons from Ireland have been held in various forms of human bondage throughout history, but they have never been chattel slaves in the West Indies, nor is there any evidence of Irish chattel slavery in the North American colonies. There were a large number of Irish indentured servants, and there were cases in which Irish men and women were sentenced to indentured servitude in the New World and forcibly which you was talking about, John, uh, forcibly shipped across the Atlantic. But even involuntary laborers had more autonomy than enslaved Africans, and the large majority of Irish indentured servants came here voluntarily. Did you hear that? They came voluntarily? Yeah, but they came voluntarily, but to the reason why they came voluntarily is it's, you know, in Ireland, the, um, the British already occupied that thing, the thing in, in that, that island, and they actually forced them, they, they were just gunned down and shoot down Irish. They, they, and the thing is, r ethnically, racially, they're almost indiscernible from one another. The English, you know, they had the same stock originally, you know, they're Celtic or Gaelic uh, peoples, and they were treated abominably by the British. I mean, yes, they were. But you see, John Lennon even That's wrote a, just like what it says that uh, they was uh, less than a dog, no more to sin to kill. No more sin to kill an, Ir an Irishman than a dog or any other brute. Yeah, and they see the thing is, so they wasn't considered human either. See, the Irish were considered like well, and a lot of people try to claim that was because of religious difference, because the Irish were typically Catholic, but that only explains for like 400 years of the oppression going on, because you know the Church of England split was created, you know, when Henry VIII split away from the Church of Rome. But um, for, for even before then, even when they were unified as, from the Roman Catholic Church, connected together, the English treated the Irish, I mean, horrifically. I mean, they seized all their properties. They took, um, they, they, I don't know if you know this, but Ireland was heavily, uh, heavily populated with um, woods and oak, oak trees and oak forest. And uh, the British just, just cut everything down and took that property, that took lumber, it. took it to England. They, where they, they used the, the beams and those beams for their big houses and stuff. So, I mean, the Irish and ships, yeah, the Irish, they were treated horribly by the. Even John Lennon had a song where he made a reference about the genocide of the Irish mm -hmm. at the hands of the English. So, I mean, uh, and it's the thing is, they were the same. Like I said, if you put a picture of an Englishman and an Irishman or brought them together at that time, you go back in time, you they would... They look they, They're identical. I mean, they are the same same ethnic mix. You know, the only thing is, mix. is when an Irishman opened up his mouth, you can tell the difference, the way they speak. I love to hear them talk. Yeah, they got. Oh, there's nothing. I mean, the Gaelic and stuff. See, the English were a kind of a hybrid. The English is a hybrid. With, you know, the Anglo-Saxon in the word, you know, they, they consider the quintessential Englishman as Anglo-Saxon. Those are two terms of two different Germanic tribes that came from Germany and came into England. And uh -huh. then there's, there was the Celts and the Gaels, and then there was the Roman influence there. <clears throat> so if you want to know the truth about it, the English were actually, the English themselves were oppressed by the Romans. A uh, thousand years, I mean, a hundred, maybe a, a I thousand years. I think the years. Romans uh, uh, oppressed a whole lot well, they of did, but th ethnic groups. Well, they did. They, they all over the world. Take over the world. They took. They were from you know from Rome. They they actually oppressed. They were took a took a you know sucked up everybody else's tribe, and what we considered Rome. I mean, we say Roman, but that actually was just a tribe. Of mm -hmm. Italy, the you ever heard the word italicized or Itali Italia? Yeah, Italy and all that. Though they yeah, were italicized words. Well, well, the, well no, the thing is that those are all were different tribes. The, the Etruscans were there before what we consider the Italians were there, mm -hmm. and then the Rome was the well, Rome was actually a you know a. Basically, they were actually a tribe that actually be, took over and kind of unified all of what we call Italy now. And then they went, then they they went all over the world. I mean, they they put their influence all over the world in the Middle East. You know, the time of Christ, they were already in there. Um, they 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 were. There's a mixture of Greek uh, thought and long. So it's it's, a, it's such a kind of a crossroads and cross. You know, these the tumultuous cultures clashing all the time in Europe. I mean, it was it was pretty horrific too at times. I mean, it was, change is horrible. It means force change is horrible. That's some great history, and I want to introduce you to uh, my director and producer of All Points TV uh, dot com is John Wilson. 
Lord, my phone is ringing. And I mean, can you hear it ringing? Yeah, I can. Oh, I'm sorry. But let's get back to this here. What's the truth? Large numbers of indentured service did indeed immigrate from Ireland to the British colonies of North America, where they provided a cheap labor force for planters and merchants eager to exploit it. Though most crossed the Atlantic willingly, which we talked about, some Irish men and women, including criminals, as well as simply the poor and vulnerable, were sentenced to indentured servitude in Ireland and forcibly shipped to the colonies to carry out their sentences. But indentured servitude, by definition, came nowhere close to chattel slavery. And can you show that of the uh, Peter again? of how he was treated, how he was badly whipped on his back, and he was a part of chattel serves, uh, slavery. <clears throat> and I think we have did a, a story on him once, one, of, one of these times. We've been doing this a long time about this, this very man here with all those whips on his back. And a lot of people didn't know his name, so we gave him a name to who he was. And he was a great man. He ran away from slavery, joined the army. Do you remember that story? Well, that one I was coming back to me a little bit, but I mean, it was a, that was several years ago. I think that you and uh, yeah, yeah we Catherine did that story it, yeah. on that on him because I wanted people to know who he was. But let's get back to this. Um, let me repeat this. But indentured service, by definition, came nowhere close to chattel slavery. And as you see that picture with the guy with the whip on his back that he was a part of chattel slavery. For one thing, it was temporary. All but the most serious felons were freed at the end of their contract. The colonial system also offered more lenient punishment for disobedient servants than slaves and allowed servants to petition for early release if their masters mistreat them. Now listen to that. They could petition for early release if their masters mistreat them, but Africans could not. Most importantly, servitude wasn't hereditary. Children of indentured servants were born free. Slaves' children were the property of their owners. Now, this raises the question once again. Where did the myth of the Irish slavery come from? It's not a myth. It's the truth. There was Irish slavery here in this country. A few places, uh, let me go with this, this, one, this part here. A few places the term white slavery emerged in the 17th and 18th centuries. First as a derogatory term for Irish laborers, equating their social position to that of a slave. Later as political rhetoric in, Irish, in Ireland itself, and later still as southern pro-slavery propaganda against it and industrialized north. Can you kind of uh, switch it between those pictures with the, uh, the, I think it's the little girl or it's a boy, I'm not sure what it is. <clears throat> what she or he is. Okay. More recently, Hogan notes, which is Liam, L-I-A-M, Hogan, notes several sources have conflated an indentured servitude with chattel slavery in order to argue for a particular Irish disadvantage in the Americas. When compared to other white immigrant groups, Hogan cites several writers, and these are books that you can get, Sean O'Callan in To Hell or Barbados, and Don Jordan and Michael Wash in White Cargo, The Forgotten History of Britain's White Slaves in America, who exaggerate poor treatment of Irish indentured servants and intentionally conflate their status with African slaves. Neither of the authors bother to inform the reader in a coherent manner what the difference are between chattel slavery and indentured servitude or forced labor. Now my understanding indentured servitude is they only would be in slavery for seven years and then they were set free. Yeah, but they also, during the time of their service, would actually a lot of times would be, there would be like a cost occurred to their keep and that would be passed on by their people they were, as, you know, they were in servitude to and they would have to continue their service even a prolonged period of time because basically, you remember, you ever 
heard the story, the company store where they actually had a labor and they had a the store, the company owned, the coal company owned the store they were buying the provisions from. So no, no matter how many times, they, how many hours they worked, they'd always be in arrears to the uh, company. That's exactly what they did a certain lot of times with the, the you know, the uh, indentured servitude. They kept on adding a long to longer times to these people. So it was a much different. Really wasn't much different from you know the the company stores. Well, it's a form of slavery. They couldn't escape. They could be brought back by force of law. Yeah, it could have been. But also that was uh you know actually some of the the Africans that were brought over here were indentured slaves. It was t made into law in some I can't I don't know the date when they made them uh, perpetual life uh, slaves. Okay, this is an important point. Indentured servitude was difficult. Deadly work and many indentured servants died before their term was over. As John had kind of touched on that. But indentured servitude was tempor temporary with a beginning and an end. Those who survived their terms received their freedom. Another way that also that it was hard to uh, enslave white people, it was because of they could run away and flow and, and just merge in with other white people and so the, and also after that they tried to do use uh native americans when well, native americans would run away also and so they finally came up with the idea of using africans and when they got to the africans africa africans could not run away because of the color of their skin so it's a lot of dynamics in this you know that goes i said i can say i can see that very easily um but uh the um Mr. Moss has made several points too during his. Um, we talked about this on a personal level, but uh, there, are, um, you know, the there are a lot of people from Eastern Europe were forced in out and out chattel slavery from Eastern Europe, where we like we like I said, you've heard the expression of Slavic people, right? Yeah. That means slave. Okay, that the word that gives rise right to the word slave. The term came comes from. from right. So they were talking and took into the Middle East. Well, guess what? There are very few. There are no narratives that are existent uh, that I'm aware of from those people from their descendants because they were butchered. The Men were like made eunuchs and then killed off when they were weakened at their old age, and the women were repeatedly raped and abused and then killed off as well. So I mean, there was chattel slavery amongst whites, and amongst people who are non-whites going to people who are non-whites. So, I mean, that did happen. Maybe not so much as the Irish, but it did happen with the Eastern European people, like the, what we call the Slavic people. They call themselves Rus, by the way, and that's where we, and Russia is considered the mother of Russia, the mother of all Rus, mm -hmm. the, the Rus, R-U-S, and I think it because it meant they had Rus hair or red hair or something like that. But it's they were sla they were enslaved. They and they did not ever come back from slavery in the East. They never came back. Well, neither did the Irish. Mm -mm. They didn't come back either. And once they was there and they served their time, they went on and lived their lives in the colonies. People got killed off in the east. When they went to the yep. east, they got butchered. Okay. Yep. Uh, servants could even petition, like I said earlier, for early release due to mistreatment. And colonial lawmakers established different, offer lesser punishments for disobedient servants compared to disobedient slaves. That was that picture I showed you of Peter with his, how his back was beaten. He was whipped up real bad. Well, today we know those are called keloids. You know, and black people have suffered a lot from that. I know that. Um, I know that the, the, for some reason, blacks um, when they shave have that tendency to, for basically the scar, the scar tissue is so th much thicker, it doesn't just blend back into the normal skin. It doesn't skin. go back. It doesn't. And, and it's, that's because of some numerous things that's going on Killing in you. the body, in the skin, that makes them things grow out of, especially on the back of of uh, when they get ears pierced. They had them big keloids. Well, that's what's on that slave's back. Those are keloids. It's, it's, it looks pretty. And I've seen um, other pictures of like that, you know, of and I could imagine being, that they, they when a person is whipped, that actually cuts the skin right open, especially if they use like a cat of nine cat tails. Cat of nine, yeah. And it just rips the shred, it just pulls it, just rips it right out. You got that, that's an open wound. If it's not taken care of or, you know, prevented from some kind of infection. Uh, oh, they used infection. to pour salt in it and hot pepper. I mean, I, I just, I always be amazed at the humanity, inhumanity of another human being toward another human being of the things that they would do to them. But I think, John, our time is going and we need to wrap it up. How we doing? We're at uh, 34 minutes right now. We don't went over. Yeah, that's okay. Okay. Yep. Um, let me see. Let me get where I was. 
Above all, like I said earlier, indentured servitude wasn't in hereditary. The children, children of servants were free. The children of slaves were property. To elide this is to diminish the realities of chattel slavery, which perhaps is one reason the most vocal purveyors of the myth are neo-confederates and white supremacist groups. Bottom line, even if many uh, Irish immigrants face discrimination and hard lives on these shores, it doesn't change the fact that America that American slavery, hereditary, and race-based was a massive institution that shaped and defined the political economy of colonial America and later the United States. Nor does it change the fact that this institution left a profound legacy for the descendants of enslaved Africans who even after emancipation were subject to almost a century of violence, disenfranchisement, and pervasive oppression with social, economic, and cultural effects that, pers that persist to today. Do you have any more comments, John? Because I'm through with this. this no, I think uh, you covered it pretty well. Yeah. It, it's not a myth. It actually happened. So I wanted just to get that right, you know, debunk a lot of the myths that they say that's going on, but also let people know that white supremacist groups are using this fact. But it is a fact. Ain't no use about it. It's no lie about it. So, But, you know, don't take it and use it as a hate point, you know, uh, to recruit our young people. All right. That's our story about white Irish slaves for this day. Miss B will be back on our next program. Satora's Black History Corner Internet program comes to you via satellite at allpointstv.com. You can watch our program every second and fourth Monday of the month unless the day falls on the holiday at 3.30 p.m. Also be sure to watch uh, political pundit Dr. Mo George Moss every Monday at 2 p.m. on his program called What's Going On. Uh, to receive our theme song, Be Proud to Be Back Black. And, and you really, it, was, it really would be a good song for Kwanzaa and, and for Martin Luther King and Black History Month. It's a good time to help him and, you know, like I always say, lift up our youth. Contact TP Productions at 810-962-3258. 810-962-3258. Be proud to be black. Since Kwanzaa, Martin Luther King Day, and Black History Month celebrations are all coming up. Oh, I already said this. It would be good to get this CD <laughs> uh, featuring Martin Luther King and, and uh, Malcolm X. Uh, our program, God's Cup of Blessing Youth Ministry, is finally being shown on allpointstv.com. And it's hosted by me, Shepherdess Catherine Hunter-William, and directed by John Wilson. You can watch both of our programs any day or night. All you have to do is Google allpointstv.com backslash YouTube. Also, allpointstv.com programs are being shown on Comcast Channel 17 every Tuesday night from 8.30 to 9.30 p.m. As always, I like to say Asante Sana, which means thank you very much in Swahili. To all of those who have watched our program today, and we definitely hope that you have been filled with high spirits and knowing that we have a great story and we encourage you to learn about our story. Until next time, we wish you all a happy Kwanzaa Kwanza, and a blessed and prosperous new year. And of course, as always, we like to say, know that black Americans are strong and resilient people and that no one can keep us down. Speak Romans 8. And 31. Be proud to be black and always keep on keeping on with us. Hotep, which means peace.